Good evening, everyone. I'm Jeff Robinson, one of the producers of Who We Are, a Chronicle of Racism in America. I grew up in the late 50s and the 60s in Memphis, Tennessee, with my family active in the civil rights movement. I went to Marquette University and Harvard Law School. I spent 34 years as a criminal defense lawyer dealing with issues of racism in the criminal legal system. But when deaths in my family caused my 13-year-old nephew living in New York City to become my 13-year-old son living with me in Seattle, Washington, I found myself reading about race in a different way, and I found myself uncovering stuff I had never heard before. Lyrics to one of my favorite songs came into my mind. I can't get my head around it. I thought I'd found it, but I found out I don't know shit. And what I didn't know about our hidden history in America of anti-Black racism could make a documentary film. And that's what we did. And here is a clip to give you an idea of what it's about. If you have ever owned a slave, please raise your hand. Slavery is not our fault. We didn't do it. We didn't cause it. But it is our shared history. Slavery had nothing to do with the war. And so if I make the statement to you, America was founded on white supremacy. Lynchings or hangings took place here. It's a genocide. It's an ethnic cleansing. The bodies were dumped all the way where the underpass is, and they intentionally put the interstate on top of their bodies. It's ingrained in my memory. I'm just looking at him in the ditch with his eyes open. My daddy sat on the carport right here in a lawn chair with a shotgun across his lap because he was going to be ready if somebody came to the house. Wow. There must be a revolution of values in our country. I cannot look at that video in its entirety. And my brother did not deserve to die unarmed with his hands in the air. It will never get easier to have an honest discussion about race in America than it is right now. Because if we wait, it is only going to get harder. Who We Are is a chronicle of racism in America, not the chronicle of racism in America, because the chronicle would include all kinds of groups that have been discriminated against in this country. I'm trying to tell the story of anti-Black racism. And as I learned things about our past, one of the things I learned about was the Tulsa massacre. I had never read anything about this in any part of my education. And the more I read, the more I knew that when we started filming, we had to go to Tulsa. It was obvious. And I wanted to talk to people who could explain what happened, why it happened, and what needs to be done about it. And three of those people are here with me this evening. And I want to start with Dr. Tiffany Crutcher. Dr. Crutcher, would you introduce yourself, please? Well, thank you so much, Jeff, for, for having me on this panel. And I'm just honored to participate uh, on this prestigious platform. I'm Dr. Tiffany Crutcher from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I'm the founder of the Terrence Crutcher Foundation and the Black Wall Street Memorial. And I'm also the director of the Justice for Greenwood Foundation. Chief, could you introduce yourself next? Absolutely. Uh, Chief Amashan, president of the African Ancestral Society, um, descendant of survivor Raymond Beard Sr. and um, an advocate for our, our community. And um, I'm grateful to be a part of this wonderful panel and grateful to be part of this, this film that you've, pleased, that you've put together that really reflects um, who we are. So thank you very much. And Christine, last but not least, please introduce yourself. I am Christy Williams, also known as Arisha B. E., born of the forces of nature, and I am an advocate. I am, um, I chair the Greater Tulsa African American Affairs Commission um, in the city of Tulsa, and um, I'm just a lover of my community and my people. 
Well, I am just thrilled to have three people from Tulsa, Oklahoma here with me this evening to talk about this. And Christy, I think there are a lot of people in America who have heard the term Black Wall Street. They may have even seen something on an HBO show called Watchmen. And that was maybe the first kind of thing that they're learning about in terms of what happened in Tulsa. Can you tell me what was Black Wall Street? Was that just a street or was it something more? Um, absolutely not. And, and when I explain what Black Wall Street was, I have to start back by saying, you know, um, before Oklahoma became a state, it was Indian territory. Um, and the only people who could own land here was Indians and Black people. And so Greenwood uh, was actually created on allotted Indian territory, allotted land, um, and we, which was through the Dawes Act. But, you know, Edwin McCabe, who founded Langston, Oklahoma, it was his dream to have Oklahoma become an all-Black state. And so he would send recruiters out throughout the South to tell black people to come live here. So it became the promised land. It was the safe haven for black people, um, particularly of sharecroppers who just wanted to come here and just be free of racial oppression. But Black Wall Street was not just a street. It was Greenwood. It was 40 city blocks um, of a community, a strong black community. And when did you first learn about the stories of what happened there? Mm -hmm. I, I always tell people that Greenwood knew me before I knew Greenwood. Um, you know, my, my aunt, my great aunt, Janie Edwards, she was in the Dreamland Theater when the massacre happened. And we would hear those stories as a kid, but I never put it together. But it wasn't until I um, got out of high school that I really learned about uh, Greenwood and I was like, oh, that's that's what that is. And um, so I started learning about it. And then through my cousin Chief, who is here with us, I learned so much more and was able to meet um, survivors, um, and particularly Wes Young, Otis T. Clark. And I got to know them. And, um, you know, and I, and I just say, you know, Greenwood knew me before I knew Greenwood. Chief, I have, uh, in, in the research I've done and in talking with you and Christy and taking the real Black Wall Street tour, uh, which you were kind enough to take me on when we came to Tulsa, uh, I am seeing records of stores, uh, all kinds of businesses, all kinds of community-based wealth. What was it that happened? that led this community to be destroyed? How did this, how did this come about? Well, contrary to popular belief, it wasn't about Dick Rowland and Sarah Page. It was about um, control, right? It was about land. It was about jealousy. It was about seeing a people that you've spent the past few decades dehumanizing in the past few, 100 years, a few hundreds of years before that, just, uh, you know, trying to transform human beings into beasts who took press, you know, who transcended your ideas or America's ideas. And these people who saw their dreams go up in smoke in a matter of 24 hours were the victims of such sickness, a, a real mental health issue, right? A real, a real serious spiritual issue. But Greenwood, the whole entire district, when you hear Black Wall Street, don't think about a linear street that goes north and south, right? Or east and west. You need to think about a three and a half square mile area that was destroyed in 24 hours, in a little over 24 hours. And Chief, as you're but talking about this, could we could we roll the tape of uh, there is some footage of of what happened in Greenwood. And as you're can we roll this tape as Chief is explaining what happened? So, you know, there's been this there's been this idea of what the what did the destruction of Greenwood look like? What did it entail? Like, as you look at this video, I want you to imagine hearing the screams of people burning inside of homes. I want you to smell 
what the smell of burning flesh could probably could possibly smell like. I want you to look at the furniture sitting outside of those homes that have been looted in, the, in that video. That's what you see, right? And people, you see little Africa in the video and people say that was a demeaning statement, but for somebody to compare you to a continent, I'll take that. When you look at this video, that's not the result of fire. When you have bricks in the middle of the street, that's the result of bombing. Just like Twin Towers, just like the Oklahoma City Murrow building. And Chief, am I right that uh, the, the Tulsa massacre was the first incident of aerial bombing in United States history because white people took airplanes, dropped burning balls of turpentine on homes and businesses, and then shot black folks when they ran outside? Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it was a, it, even to call it a massacre marginalizes it. That was a, that was a true genocide. That was ethnic cleansing. That's what you're witnessing. When you look at this, that's, that's what you're witnessing. You're not witnessing and, and is, some small trivial event. And, and part of what we're looking at now is the issue of troops being rushed to the scene. And I'd <laughs> like people to think about the images that we saw when Black Lives Matter protests uh, had violence and how the troops were protecting property. And look what these troops were doing when it was black homes and neighborhoods that were being destroyed. And I don't know what to say about this, Chief. Well, you know, peace, peaceful Negroes. You had that tag that he's wearing, that police protection. In order to leave the concentration camps that were put in place, you had to wear that, right? You, you are no longer a free citizen. You are enslaved. That's what you call a useful Negro now, right? As opposed to an independent, self-sustaining, self-sufficient individual who has learned how to accept its, its, its place in humanity. That's what you just witnessed in watching that. Chief, you talked about, uh, we talked about what happened here. Obviously there was personal and community wealth that was devastated. Didn't people have insurance policies? Yeah, they did. And there were, there were hundreds of insurance claims. Most of these people, and this is one of the reasons we, we don't use the term riot, right? So historically, there was a riot clause in the insurance policies that did not allow people to recover claims during the massacre or after the massacre. So all those people who had property that was destroyed, there was no, there was no opportunity to recover because it was written into the insurance policy that you could not recover in the event of a riot. But that's not a riot what we saw. That's not a riot what you witnessed. That was the Holocaust. And what about police involvement and what happened in 1921? We, we, don't, we don't even need to say police involvement. That was a police action, right? The police, the police narrated, they headed that activity. Anytime the police takes it upon themselves to deputize hundreds of people in a city, that is police conduct. That's police activity. That's not mob activity. Right? That's not uh, a militia. That's not individual uh, hoodlums or thugs. That is the police department itself. That's the city of Tulsa saying, I'm going to violate your 14th Amendment. You don't have equal protection under the law. You, you're not going to get those same uh, rights as a citizen that I have. Right? That's what, you, that's what we're talking about when we talk about the destruction and the, 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 the Holocaust. Let's just call it what it is. It was an actual, that we experienced, we witnessed a Holocaust happen in the United States of America. And in that same country would go and defend other people who were victims of a Holocaust, but not in their own land. Not, not in Dr. their own land. Dr. Crutcher, we're talking about police involvement. And almost a century later in 2016, your brother is the victim of police violence again. Can you talk to us about the connections you see between what happened in 1921 and what happened in Tulsa in 2016 with your brother? Yes, absolutely. Um, almost 100 years later, Tulsa is still out of order and, and, and I'm triggered just 
you know, watching that video and hearing Chief, you know, speak about state sanctioned violence and and my twin brother was killed by the same police department. I always say that the same police department that burnt down Greenwood or Black Wall Street is the same police department, the same state sanctioned violence that killed my tw twin brother in 2016, unarmed with his hands uh, in the air. And, and so nothing has really changed. And, and, you know, there were unarmed Black citizens who are thriving, innocent Black people who are living their lives, as, as Chief said, who are self-sufficient, prosperous. And this mob, the, the KKK, they came and, and they killed unarmed citizens. Same with my twin brother, almost 100 years later. He was unarmed, uh, hands in the air, and, and they shot him down. And, and those parallels are so stark, Jeff, because uh, nobody rendered aid. You know, they told the people back in 1921, you know, the first um, responders that if you go and help these these Negroes, we're going to kill you too. When Terrence was shot by Officer Betty Shelby, a police officer said, don't give him first aid, don't touch him. And so they let him lie on the ground and take his last breath alone. And and, and guess what? The victim blaming started. You know, they called it a riot because they said it was our fault. You know, we started the riot. My ancestors started it. And the same thing goes for what happened almost 100 years later. The mayor went on national TV, Mayor G.T. Bynum, and said it was Terrence's fault. You know, it was, it, it was more about the insidious use of drug use more so than it was about race. And if you think about Betty Shelby, she stated that he made me do it and I had never been so afraid in my life, a white woman saying that she had never been so afraid because she encountered a black man that wasn't committing a crime. He wasn't under arrest. He didn't have a weapon. All he did was help. So the parallels are so stark. When I think about Chief saying that, man, you know, bombs were dropped from the air. Helicopters were looming in 2016, Jeff. Helicopters were looming. Uh, uh, at the scene where my brother was killed. And in that hel helicopter, those police officers said that my brother looked like a bad dude. So I, I, you know, nothing has changed almost 100 years later. The same state sanctioned violence that killed innocent black people in 1921 that burned down Greenwood is the same state sanctioned violence that killed my twin brother. And when you, Tiffany, I know that you have not watched that video, and I understand, have not watched that video in its uh, complete form. But uh, what is horrific about it and relating to what happened in Tulsa is that with his hands in the air, in a car that the officer had already cleared and knew there wasn't a weapon in the car, and with the driver's side window rolled up, so it was impossible for him to reach inside the car. People in the helicopter above saw a black man with his hands in the air, walking away from police officers and doing nothing threatening. And their response was, that looks like a bad dude. And if they had seen a white man in the exact same circumstances, I think that man would be at home having dinner with his family tonight. Christy, as we think about what happened in Tulsa and its relationship to what's happening today, are there other parallels that you see? And, you know, one of the things that we saw uh, is what happened at the Capitol on January 6th. What were your thoughts about that? You know, I didn't have too many thoughts really about it because that was a white on white crime. I mean, that that's just the way that I saw it. I knew nothing was gonna come of it. Um, but I did think if it was black people, they would have been dead. They would have been shot dead. Um, that was my thoughts about what happened at the Capitol. Um, and that's just our reality. That's, that's just our, our reality, but it was a reminder um, of what 
black people have to go through in this country. Well, Chief, and, and you, you please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, if I could just piggyback off of that, um, uh, the parallels I saw um, were when I saw that video at the nation's capital or actually saw it take place real time, I couldn't help but think about the mobs of white rioters uh, in 1921. It, it was like deja vu uh, for me all over again. And, you know, when you think about how this massacre started, it started with a lie. It was incited by, by the Tulsa Tribune with a lie. Um, and, and, and I believe that on January 6th, that, that mob, that riot was started because of a lie by the ex-president of the United States of America, Donald Trump. And, you know, uh, that's what happens. But as Christy said, had that been a Black Lives Matter rally or a Black Lives Matter protest, I don't even think we would have gotten to the, to the building. We wouldn't even got past the barricades. But if we would have gotten past those barricades, guess what? It would have been another massacre that would have took place uh, almost 100 years later. I think there would have been dead bodies around the Capitol if it had been black protesters. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and so as, as you think about what happened in Tulsa, um, I, I just want to go back to this for a minute because I'm interested. When did y'all learn about what happened in Tulsa? And was there anything in your high school education that focused on like Oklahoma history or something that would have made it mandatory to teach this to people? Well, Jeffrey, let me, if I may, let me go back to something. I just want to show you this, this, this image, right? Because we're talking about those parallels. If you can see that. Yes. Yes. These are black men with their hands up. It's, it, the picture says captured Negroes, right? Not detained, but captured Negroes with their hands up, just like Terrence Crutcher had his hands up. When you talk about that Capitol building, there are, there are, the parallels are so identical. Like if you don't learn from the past, you do repeat history. Because what happened at the courthouse in Tulsa, Oklahoma, on the day that of May 31st, the mob, the mob had already broken into the courthouse building. Nobody ever talks about that. Three men had already broken the door, broken into the doors of the courthouse building to, to get Dick Rowland. The same way they went into the uh, into the Capitol building, right? Same mindset, same rage, same attitude, right? As if this is a patriotic act. You just you just committed crimes breaking into a a, a municipal building, right? That's a crime. So those men should have been arrested at that point. It shouldn't have progressed any further than that. Mm -hmm. But it did progress further than that, right? And so those are the parallels that we're looking at. We are literally recycling history. What happened before 21? You had the Spanish flu of 1918. We got COVID flu. What happened after uh, COVID? What happened after COVID? You had riots all across the nation. What happened in, in, in America? Riots all across the nation. Then what happened when we decided to show up at the courthouse building? If we had shown up at the at the uh, Capitol building, they would have burned all of Washington, D.C. down. If we had showed up to defend and, and if just to say we defend our rights as citizens, we defend we're, we're going to fight against tyranny as patriots. If we had showed up and said we're going to defend the Capitol building because we are patriots, they would have burned a Washington DC down just like they burned down Tulsa, Oklahoma. And Chief, as you as you talk about that and you showed that picture, it just brought me back to a moment when you and Christy took me on the real Wall Street tour. And could you just tell folks where those black men were headed and whether they ever came out from where they were headed? Yeah, those black men, they were marched to Convention Hall. Convention Hall eventually became Brady Theater. But they were marched there and many of those men never came out of that building. There were people who witnessed them go in but never come out. And that place became a trophy in the city of Tulsa. It became the Brady Theater. 
and it became a place of entertainment, right? A place that had that kind of history became a place of entertainment. One woman even had a stillborn inside that building. That's when they realized we only, we're going to only put men in this building. We'll take women and children to the fairgrounds and to uh, McNulty Park. But that concentration camp, that death hall, that's what, that's what convention hall became, a death hall. Let me go back to your experiences growing up in Tulsa. This is the legacy literally of your families, your ancestors. Was it taught in high school? Wasn't there some kind of emphasis on Oklahoma education that would have brought folks to this? I'm asking any of you, any of the three to jump on this one. Jeff, you know, there, in, in my high school, there was nothing taught about Greenwood or Black Wall Street. Um, I did take Oklahoma history. That is a required course in high school. And in Oklahoma history, I learned about the five civilized tribes. I learned that they came on the Trail of Tears, but they'd also never said that those tribes uh, had slaves, black people with them here. Um, so this city, this state, has just made it a habit of keeping history, our history, up under, uh, up under a rug and just telling half truths of what happened. Um, and that has been the same for years. And I would ask my mother, why y'all never talk about this stuff? Or, you know, why was this never mentioned? And, you know, and they would always say, because during that time, you had to face the very people who murdered your family. Um, you had to work and see these people all the time. So you didn't say anything. When it was out of fear. And, and like Dr. my Dr. family, yeah. same, same. I mean, the exact same. Uh, I have the exact same story Christy has. I, I didn't learn about uh, the massacre until I went off to college. And I went to school right on, you know, uh, Greenwood, Carver Junior High. I went to Booger T. Washington High School, which was a school right there during that time. Uh, of the massacre, it didn't get burnt down. Uh, but I went off to college, Jeff, and uh, people from Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, Detroit would ask, where are you from? And I would say Tulsa, and they would automatically say, oh, Black Wall Street or Tulsa Race Riot. And I had no idea. After the third time somebody said that, I went home and I said, dad, what are these people talking about? And that's when I learned that my great grandmother Rebecca Brown Crutcher had to flee in fear of her life. And she never uttered a word about it to us. And, and, and I can't help but go back to that video that was played at the outset of this panel, um, watching those buildings burn. I can only imagine my grandmother trying to get out of harm's way. But yeah, we, we, we took Oklahoma history, but all we learned about was the Trail of Tears. Not one iota, not one word, and um, it's just so unfortunate, and I, I think it's sinful. Chief, do you think that this lack of education, was this a mistake? Was this, and I guess I'm being uh, somewhat facetious, but it seems to me that this was purposeful. This was done deliberately. Well, for, for, for our people, for African people in that district, and it, it was an act of survival. It was an act of how do you, how do you transcend collective trauma, right? You find some very productive ways to figure out how to, how to, how to transcend it because the alternative it's stuff that we don't even want to think about today. When you think about, when you ask people, what would you do if that had been done to you? The response is always something very tragic, right? It's, it's not justice, it's revenge. So you have people who had children, who had families, who had a whole community who said, we cannot, let's, let's, we gotta, we, gonna, we got to figure this out. 
Now, when people, when I say survival, let me help people, the listeners understand. The Ku Klux Klan grew by the thousands after the massacre in the city of Tulsa alone. Its membership grew exponentially. It grew. They spent the entire year, the Klan, the Home Guard, they spent the entire year of 1922 terrorizing the black community because they would have whipping parties and kidnappings. So if they heard about people becoming politically adept or politically active, or if they heard about people who were talking about the massacre in any form or fashion, you could find yourself being kidnapped in the middle of the night, taken out into the country and whipped, tarred and feathered. Or you could find yourself missing an ear or any other body part, because that was the custom. That was the practice of, we don't have to tell you to shut up. We're going to convince you to be quiet. Then you will help participate in the conspiracy of silence. As you think about what happened and we think about how the black community has tried to deal with this, as you said, Chief, coming up with different strategies of how you cope, the white silence on this issue comes from a very different place. Christy, have you thought about Absolutely. that? Why is it that white Tulsans seem to be not only ignorant of this history, but unwilling to talk about it? You know, they know about it. They definitely know about it. They just don't care. And, you know, and today what you see happening now, especially with um, white, and let me just say, there are some white people who do care, right? But there are a lot of people, white people who don't. And then there you have white people who have created organizations, um, committees, um, it really to make money off of our oppression of what happened. And they wanna talk about reconciliation. They wanna talk about healing. You know, they'll give you a, a, a sign, they'll give you a, a memorial, they'll give you some plaques, those things. And then they wanna call that healing. They, but they don't wanna deal with the real issues. And the thing that kills me about when, you know, when you get these white folks to come together and they wanna talk about healing what are we healing from? They see that that question is never asked. We never talk about that. What are we healing from? But to just to go back on your question, you made me just start talking about that. But white people know. I don't believe it when they say that they don't know at this point. White people know. They're 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 very aware of what's going on. Um, you see it just reading the comments on the the news. Um, Facebook pages, they know, they know. Well, it's it's interesting that uh, I think when we go around America in general, um, the parts of our anti-Black history that are not taught, that are not uh, part of the education of our children, that are not talked about in social discourse, that are not talked about in the political halls in Washington, DC. Uh, avoiding talking about those things means that you don't have to think about what you need to do about them. And you've talked about people who want healing and reconciliation. And before you have healing, don't you have to have a reckoning for what happened before you can heal from what happened? And so with, with that thought, I want to throw some things out to you and get your reaction. If I use the phrase gold-plated medallion, what do you think about when it relates to the way the city of Tulsa has responded to what happened in Greenwood and their responsibility for what happened? <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> that's all I can say. Because um, because that that's exactly what it is. It, that's exactly what it is. And you know, we have to ask ourselves too, as Black people. And some Black people get upset when I say when I say this, but we have to constantly ask ourselves, what am I accommodating? What am I tolerating that does not honor my ancestors? that does not honor my community, 
that does not honor my people. And I'm gonna say that again, we have to ask ourselves, what are we accommodating? What are we tolerating that does not honor our ancestors, that does not honor ourselves, that does not honor our community, and does not honor our people? Because we don't and get so, angry enough. Tiffany, I see you're like ready to jump. Please jump right in here. <laughs> Christy has me fired up. You all have me fired up. Um, I, this gold medallion, you know, that's all the survivors received. There were survivors that fought until their last breaths for reparations, for restitution, for atonement, for what happened to them in 1921. And they made it to the US Supreme Court and they decided to close the case because the statute of limitations had ran out, but they gave them a gold medallion. I can't help but think about the last, the, the three last known living survivors who are here in Tulsa with us today, who survived one of the worst racial terror atrocities in this country, in this nation, and they've received no justice. And we, like Christy said, you know, we're getting ready to encroach on the centennial, the 100 year anniversary of the 1921 race massacre. And all you hear about is uh, what's getting ready to happen and, and how we're gonna you know, make this a tourist attraction. And I think that is just appalling because right now, it, Demario Solomon Simmons, who's leading a, a lawsuit on behalf of the, the, the survivors, he says that this is not a tourist attraction. Black Wall Street, the community of Greenwood is still a crime scene a crime today. Scene. And we have exactly. treated as such uh, as sacred land. And, and, and our ancestors are still crying out from the soil saying, remember me, because it was erased from the history books. And we have a duty, as Chrissy said, Black people who, who are descendants of survivors to right that wrong and honor and remember, but also fight like hell to get justice for these women who are 106 years old, Mother Lessie B. Randall and Mother Fletcher and her baby brother who was six months old at the time, Van Hughes Ellen. They should be the center, they should be honored. It shouldn't be about a history center. It shouldn't be about a, a, a legacy fest. It shouldn't just be about that. It should be about making sure that we honor them and that we seek compensation uh, uh, for the victims that survived. And so that's the only way we get to a place of reconciliation and true healing. And it starts with accountability and it starts with atonement and restitution. There is no parent in America who would say to their child, you have done a wrong, but we're not gonna talk about that. Just come here and let me hug you because I just wanna get to reconciliation and healing. There is no parent in America that would not talk to their child and have a reckoning so the child understands what was done wrong so that it won't be repeated. Chief, I have to come to you for a second because one of the most chilling moments when we were filming in Tulsa was when you and Christy and I were in the cemetery, Oaklawn Cemetery, and you were talking about the number of people that cannot be accounted for after the massacre. Could you say again what that number was? <clears throat> well, I, I, I will. I, I really need to deal with this medallion. I got, let me speak to that too. Because my Please grandfather was a, yes. my, my grandfather was a recipient of one of those medallions, one of those tokens. And I'm sitting here listening to all of this and I thought to myself, can you imagine giving the victims of the Twin Towers a medallion? Or giving the victims of the Oklahoma City Merrill Building bombing a medallion, but no compensation? In each of those cases, there was compensation. They had a victim's compensation fund for the bombing on domestic soil. But our mayor thinks that that is something that divides people. But it brought us together when the Twin Towers fell. It brought us together when the Murrow Building fell. 
My grandfather looked at that coin when he got back home and he said, what am I going to do with this shit? Like, and I felt it. He said, I can't even put that in my coin collection box because it has no value. It's plated. It's not even real gold. So on behalf of those 15,000 people that lived in the Greenwood district, that many say only 10,000 because of a census report. We barely fill out the census today. So we know the numbers are skewed. If you have documentation that 6,000 people were cared for or looked after, then what happened to the other 4,000? Let's go with the lowest number, 10,000 people. What happened to the other 4,000? Let's just say 1,000 were able to run for their lives and make it out of the city, even though they had the whole city surrounded. So if you didn't get out in advance on the 31st, you didn't yeah. get out, okay? What happened to those 4,000 people or now 3,000? We just hypothetically saying 1,000 got away. So you, got to, you, got, you, got, you still have a few thousand left that are unaccounted for. But Chief, don't we know something about accounting for them because of the discovery of evidence of mass graves in Tulsa? I can do you better than that. We started with a dozen. The first report was a dozen. That number went to 30. Then it went to 100. Today, we're talking about 300 with no evidence, mind you. Right? Like who, who put the number at 300? How did we go from 100 to 300? And how do we account for that? Where are the records that show us that we have legitimately gone? These are historians who talk about this, who say we've gone now from 100 to 300. Where is the evidence? Because wherever that evidence is, that's probably where the other thousands are. You see, this conspiracy of silence continues. And that's why I use the term Holocaust. That's why I use the term ethnic cleansing and genocide, because that's seriously what we are talking about here. When I stood in that grave as a, as a member of the oversight committee and I stood in that ground and I looked at that little bitty box about the size of a shoebox, a coffin inside this pit, inside this trench where these graves, these mass graves in Oakland Cemetery, I thought to myself, not even dignity for a baby. They didn't even have the dignity to sign their death certificates by a physician. They had a layman sign the death certificates. They didn't even embalm the bodies. They threw them in wood boxes and then put them in a trench. Where's the humanity in that? I see why they needed to keep it a secret. Because to expose that level of inhumanity to man would mean the whole world would have to respond to what has happened in Tulsa, because the whole city of Tulsa is a graveyard. Chief. And just think about Dr. what Chief said, Jeff. Oh, I was just saying, and, and just thinking about, you know, what Chief said, and then they keep touting reconciliation as it's going to just lead to healing. How do you, how can you have reconciliation after what Chief just described? You know, it's, it's crazy. And reconciliation is just, it's so, it, it's, it's, it's manipulation. Really, that's what it is. Because reconciliation has become a business. It's become a cash mm. business. And they mm. use that to make money because if they wanted to end this, they could end this shit right now. But they don't. You see all these organizations that is just, this, 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 cling to reconciliation. They're not talking about policy. They're not talking about ending anything. They're not. It's just all about- They're not about talking happening. about reparations. They're not talking about not investments talking about into reparations. the community. Right. They're not talking about reparations. They're not talking about policy. And it is a known fact that reconciliation has become a business. You didn't even start hearing the word reconciliation until the 90s mm -hmm. and, and, and internationally, you know, and, and just the, the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission that cost $52 million. It's a $52 million cash cow. And that's why people will throw programs at you 
oh, okay, black people are hurting in housing. Here's a program. Black people are hurting on uh, police brutality. Here's a program. Because people are getting paid. These are jobs. So if they ended all this stuff right now, it'd be so many jobs that would be lost. So many jobs well, that would be lost. And so we have to wise up about that because when we get these black leaders and so-called so-called black leaders, you know, they're caught up in that framework of racial of racial reasoning. And they reason away a lot of this stuff. Black people who know better, but they want to get a paycheck. They want to get a paycheck for it. Well, so they you know, here's, here's the thing. Uh, the, there, is, there is no race of people that has ever existed on earth that didn't have members that could be moved by money and personal gain. And so this is, this is like, you know, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. How do That's you, right. let's talk about this. How do you reclaim? the narrative of Black Wall Street and, and what happened there. How do you as a community reclaim that and what part does a reparations lawsuit play in that? I'll, well, I'll, I'll answer, answer the first again. part of that and I'll pass it. And I'll pass it. I just want to answer the first. The first part of that on the narrative, Jeff, we have to start to develop our own level of authority as Black people and we have to stop being under this illusion because we see um, black faces put in leadership positions and we're calling them leaders when really they're just black people, just black people governing white affairs. We have to get that part straight first if we're going to reclaim our narrative. I, I truly believe that, but I'll go ahead and pass it on to Dr. Crutcher. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're spot, you're spot on. Uh, we we definitely have to come together collectively uh, as a community, and I, I think we are with this lawsuit that we've just filed last fall. We have so many people uh, who's come together and said enough is enough. And and, and as you all said, you're going to have certain groups of people who who are just comfortable, uh, who's afraid of getting uncomfortable. Um, but but we have a four point plan. Um, and, and that plan is to seek compensation for the survivors and the descendants of, of the massacre, uh, first and foremost. Uh, number two is to actually hold the perpetrators accountable. Yes, you will hear people say, well, uh, nobody is living that, that did this. But guess what? The entities that allowed it to happen, they're still here and they're thriving and they're capitalizing off of what happened. So the city of Tulsa, you owe. Uh, the Tulsa Development Authority, you owe. Sinc Sinclair Oil, you owe. You know, and, 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 and the Tulsa Tribune, there's so many entities that need to be brought or are held accountable. And then we want to make sure that we document and that we pu publicize the stories that were erased from the textbooks. You know, we, we right now we've partnered with the Equal Justice Initiative and Brian Stevenson, um, uh, and, and we started the Tulsa Community Remembrance Coalition, and we went around collecting soil samples from the very Tiffany, spot. Tiffany, I was going to ask you, what, what's behind you? Could you just show what's behind you? Absolutely. Uh, these are some of the soil samples right here. I don't know if I'll stand up so you all can see, but right here, you see the soil samples of Mr. Reuben Everett right here. This is a man who lost everything he had. He lost his, his, his generational wealth and they are building a history center right on the land that he lived. And, and they're gonna make money right on this man's land. And, and his story is so compelling because he lost everything. And, and so we want to make sure that we remember and that we honor those lives and that we actually hold small ceremonies and memorials and funerals um, to, to make sure they get those proper burials. The same with, with the, the mass graves excavations. You know, if those remains are from the massacre, we want to make sure that we give them a proper resting place because in my faith, Jeff, it's sinful for people to, to not, you know, uh, have a proper memorial. And so that's what we're doing. We're going to publicize and, and record the stories. And then number four, we want to tell the truth. That's how you control the narrative by 
telling the truth. Right now, people are trying to whitewash. People are trying to pretend because we're getting ready to, to, to come up on this, this anniversary. But what people need to really understand about Tulsa, Oklahoma, it's the same Tulsa because we are the only city in the United States of America that removed a Black Lives Matter mural from the street in Greenwood. In Greenwood. And the people who are saying they want reconciliation and coming together are the same people that said, take that off the street in Greenwood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, so and, and, and for the city of Tulsa to invest millions of dollars into a commemoration, but you want, the mayor won't utter the words Black Lives Matter, it is a farce. And so as a community, we have to control the narrative. We have to actually honor our ancestors the way that they should be honored. And we're not gonna let them whitewash or water down what happened to my great grandmother's community or what happened to Lessie B. Randall, Mother Viola Fletcher and uh, Hugh Van Hughes Ellis. We have to get good at controlling the narrative and telling the truth and also talking about the continual effects, the continual harm of what's happening to the descendants right now. And, and so Tulsa owes. Yes, they do. And, and so there are several things that, that I have heard. Um, number one, this Centennial Commission. Um, it sounds like there is a reason to suspect whether this commission is interested in instituting something that would actually address the legacy of what happened in 1921 or whether they just have a party i shouldn't say party i'm not trying to be flip whether they just want to have uh, a memorial on the 100th anniversary that will sell some t-shirts and 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 have some uh other kinds of impact like that jeff why wait a hundred years to do it. It's that freaking simple. Why wait a hundred years to do it? What's significant about 100 years of oppression, of injustice, of denial? What, what's, what is it? I mean, I want somebody to really explain to me the significance of why we wait 100 years to do what you could have done a hundred years ago, 10 years ago, yesterday. Like, what are you, what, what have you been waiting for? Because that right there reveals the motive. It reveals incentive. It, it basically qualifies everything these two women just said. Everything is so vagrant. It's so flippant. It's so in front of you. And if I were a survivor, I would be asking, why am I not a significant part of such a grand scheme? Not one single survivor is engaged in any of those activities from its inception. And doesn't that speak volumes? That speaks volumes, volumes. about what is going on. I want to do it's this because we are, we're going to come to the end of our time, but I want to make sure that we do a couple. BlackWallStreetMemorial.com. Just one long word, BlackWallStreetMemorial.com. Place you can go for information. If people are able to travel as the vaccine rolls out and travel becomes safer, and you are now thinking, I want to go to Tulsa to try and learn more about what happened here, as opposed to going to a t-shirt shop or someplace else, try the real Black Wall Street tour. Chief and Christy will take you and your family and demonstrate for you what actually happened there. The Terrence Crutcher Foundation is a critical part of the movement in Tulsa for restorative justice. And Dr. Crutcher, I just want to say to you, I know you left your practice. You started this foundation uh, to make sure, as you told me, that your brother's name was never forgotten and that what could be done in his legacy to improve Tulsa would be there. There is a lawsuit going on, and I will ask one of you, isn't there a website where folks can go to get information about the lawsuit? 
justiceforgreenwood.org, justiceforgreenwood.org. And, and the last thing that I want to suggest, and I won't say I'm suggesting, but in talking to Chief and Christy and, and Tiffany, you can message the mayor of Tulsa and tell him what you think about his position that a true reckoning with what happened in 1921 would divide the community as opposed to build the foundation for what could really be called reconciliation. I'll share. Send a message to the mayor of Tulsa. You can find an email address and tell him, Mr. Mayor, it's time for Tulsa to do better. Chief, Tiff, Christy, I wanna thank y'all so much I want to thank you for the work that you are doing in Tulsa for your community. I want to thank, thank you, you for my personal education about something I started talking about when I read about it, but I didn't truly understand until I came to Tulsa and talked to you folks. Uh, your fight is righteous. Your cause is just, and we will be with there with you with the Who We Are project going forward. Thank all thank of you. you so much for what you're doing. We appreciate it. Thank you.